Jackson Dart takes steps towards becoming the best quarterback in the SEC, plus two other things you need to know about. We have lines as well. This is the Locked On Ole Miss podcast. You are locked on Ole Miss. Your daily podcast on the Ole Miss Rebels. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Thanks for making the Locked On Ole Miss podcast your first listen every day. We're free and available wherever you get your podcast, including YouTube. We're part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every single day. Also, the Rebels play at the Tulane Green Wave Saturday at 2.30 Central Time. We'll see if the Rebels and the Tulane Green Wave have the matchup that we're anticipating or will the Rebels boat race them entirely? We'll find out. You can catch every play of the Rebels' hometown broadcast with SiriusXM on Channel 190 or on the SXM app. Search Rebels, Ole Miss Rebels probably as well. Hello, I'm Stephen Willis, and this is the Locked On Ole Miss podcast. And I do want to let you know this episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. It's the official sportsbook of Locked On. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers can bet $5 and get 200 and bonus bets guaranteed. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. Jackson Dart had an absolutely amazing football game this weekend. And he not only just had a good game where he looked, you know, just the casual fan, if they watched that game, they could tell that Jackson Dart was playing well. I'm going to tell you why he's playing well and why what he did in that game should get Ole Miss fans excited. It's it's a really unique thing. Now, newspaper coverage after the game was pretty spot on with people. Sports Illustrated, our Jackson Dart and Trey Harris poised for a breakout season at Ole Miss. Um, the AP Dart and Harris combination is dominant as number 22 Mississippi pulls away from Mercer 73 to 7. And David Eckert from the Clarion Ledger. Did Jackson Dart win Ole Miss quarterback job over Spencer Sanders? What Lane Kiffin said after the win. These were the main talking points after the game. And we're going to talk about a few more um, after this is over. But right now, the quarterback position kind of stole the show. I think Jackson Dart started like 11 for 11 for 200 and something yards and was playing really, really well. He just he went a little over two quarters had over 300 yards passing. He was like 18 of 25 or something like that. Four touchdowns, all to Trey Harris, by the way, the wide receiver transfer out of Louisiana Tech. And the decisiveness in which Jackson Dart was playing the position was not something we saw last year. You saw real growth, real understanding, real Quick twitch, being able to think and process information and get the ball where it needs to be. It doesn't matter if you're playing Mercer or if you're playing Georgia. Whenever a coverage presents itself, the ball is supposed to go to a, a certain location. Now, I'm not saying the ball will be completed because that the talent of the opponent comes in the equation. But the ball needs to go to the right space. Against Mercer, the ball was going to the right space. There was a couple of slips out of his hand to where it didn't quite come off. But for the mo most part, you had a situation where he was hitting wide receivers downfield with accurate passes, getting the ball to the right person for the one-on-one -on -one that Lane Kiffin wants. And the offense was just kind of purring. And I think he was in the game for like eight possessions. I think he played eight possessions or something like that on Saturday. I could be wrong about that number. It could be nine. But if you look at the drive chart, it was basically touchdown, 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 field goal, fumble, touchdown, touchdown. And that fumble, which happened, I think, on the nine or 10-yard line, somewhere going into the end zone, Ole Miss was getting ready to score another touchdown again. Um, other than that, the offense played pretty spot on, pretty flawless. And – the fumble was thing. Once it got a little bit later, it kind of got sloppy at times. Not necessarily as bad as we have seen. Like last year's Central Arkansas game was worse. And we don't even need to think about what one AA FCS games was like when Ed Orgeron was here. Um, and Jacksonville State beat Houston Nut. These F FCS games have a chance to get squirrely. 
Those teams don't have the talent of this team. At one point, just before I get into the second part of the Jackson Dart thing, at one point during mop-up time, Ole Miss had a five-star quarterback in. This was like severe mop-up time, like Kincaid Dent playing mop-up time. Five-star quarterback in at quarterback. Multiple four-star wide receivers in the game. And the running back is, a, I think, a former four-star or high three-star that was a backup running back at Oregon State last year. This is different. And as an Ole Miss fan, we need to process that and understand that and set our expectations accordingly. Because going into an Ole Miss football game, we are picturing what the roster is going to look like for us and what the roster is going to look like for them. And most of the time, the talent advantage goes to them. Not anymore. That is not the case any longer. So get excited about that almost more than anything. But we're still talking about Jackson Dart. Sorry, I got a little bit off track there for a second. For the better part of a year, I, I figure last October we were talking about this. And it was Jackson Dart in the middle of the field and how the middle of the field was a problem. And I put up statistics that showed that there was a problem in the middle of the field. I have since done shows that said, hey, maybe this wasn't all Jackson Dart's fault. Maybe there was a type of a wide receiver issue and a lack of a tight end and all of that as well. Trying to dig into why there was a donut-sized hole in the middle of the field. And wondering, actively wondering for the last six months of whether or not Jackson Dart was going to be able to fix his problems in the middle of the field and to become a more complete quarterback. And I was on this pretty consistently for the last six months to the point where I was accused of talking about it too much. And I talked about it as much as I did because it was important and it was something that was very real that made Quinshawn play a little bit differently. The outside wide receivers, the play calling was different because of that problem. But if you look at the Mercer game, these are the zones for Jackson Dart in the Mercer game. The lowest two zones of the field in 2022 was the deep middle and the middle of the tic-tac-toe board. Um, those were the weak points last season. This game, deep middle, one for one, 34 yards, 118 NFL passer rating. Absolutely fantastic there. Middle of the field, the middle of the tic-tac-toe board. Jackson Dart was 6 of 7, 146 yards. That's nearly half of his passing yards was in this zone. Three touchdowns, no interceptions, a perfect 158.3 NFL passer rating. If you look at his other numbers, he was one out of two with a touchdown to the left side of the field. Um, in the intermediate route, he was two for two for 39 yards. He, very good throwing the ball left, and that's probably a good thing that Trey Harris is lining up on that side. Um, short zone, two for three, 17 yards, 81 NFL passer rating. Middle of the field short, two for two for nine yards, 85 NFL passer rating. Short right, one for two, seven yards, 58.3. Those short zones, they're going to be fine, but the ball was being pushed down the field. Everybody should be really excited about what I just put up. It shows growth. It shows the quarterback taking the next step. We weren't dinking and dunking. This wasn't a Will Rogers type of game. This was driving the ball downfield. At one point in time, Jackson Dart was averaging over 20 yards per catch and $20, 20 yards per pass play. He was over 10 completions for like 215 yards. And he also, he had like seven more. So he was pretty close to 20 yards as it is, pushing the ball downfield. And that, the middle of the field, the fact that Jackson Dart was completely decisive on where it needed to go. He put it in the right places. He ran the offense, operated that. The offense ran Fairly clean. There was the fumble by Ulysses Bentley, but you can clean that up. 
There was no procedural plays. There was no things that just sloppiness happens. There wasn't a situation like the Florida game where there were two number threes on the field at the same time. All of these things were good things, and they the Ole Miss offense played really well. And it wasn't just the Ole Miss offense, but we'll talk about that and Pete Golding's debut as soon as we come back. And also we'll talk newcomers. It was all about the newcomers in the first week. And then we got um, week two lines as well. But right now, I do want to let you know that today's show is brought to you by Athletic Brewing Company. Now it's time for your game changer of the week, brought to you by Athletic Brewer Com- Brewing Company. Much like Trey Harris completely changing the wide receiver position at Ole Miss over the weekend, breaking their school record for touchdown catches. Athletic Brewing has completely changed the non-alcoholic beer game. They make non-alcoholic beers that actually taste good. One thing that we need to talk about over and over again is what Trey Harris did, okay? What Trey Harris did was catch four touchdown passes in his college debut at Ole Miss. Now, he was at Louisiana Tech. I get that. But his debut at Ole Miss, he caught four touchdown passes and had three of them in like three and a half minutes. This was a big time performance by Trey Harris and the athletic brewing company, their brewers are great tasting and award winning. And they beat full strength beers in global competition. They brew over 50 styles of craft, non-alcoholic beer, including IPAs, golden sours, and more. They're consistently releasing limited edition experimental styles to add to their variety. They're fit, fit for all times. So you can drink them anytime, anywhere, and make any activity more enjoyable. Like, watching a football game, maybe. Taking in Ole Miss and Tulane this weekend from Yulman Stadium in New Orleans. You can catch that with an Athletic Brewing Company non-alcoholic brew. You can find the Athletic Brewing Company non-alcoholic brews at a store near you, or you can buy online at athleticbrewingcompany.com. First-time customers can use Locked On the code locked on to get 15% off your first online order. That's code locked on at checkout for 15% off at athleticbrewingcompany.com. It's near beer. Exclusions and conditions apply. Athletic Brewing Company fit for all times. All right, college football season is here, and this season locked on is kicking up our coverage with locked on college football kickoff. Live each Friday, Locked On will go live from 11 a.m. Eastern to 1 p.m. Eastern on every Locked On College YouTube channel. College football kickoff live will cover playoff implications, the conference rivalry games. They go in depth like only Locked On can do, including insight and analysis from our stable of Locked On hosts covering every team every day. Find Locked On College football kickoff live every Friday from 11 a.m to 1 p.m. Eastern on any Locked On College YouTube channel. You won't want to miss it. Our friend Alex Dono from Locked On Hurricanes was on the show this past week and said that Colorado was only going to win two games this year. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure Prime, Coach Prime, is keeping receipts on that. We don't know if Deion Sanders, Coach Prime, is going to bring that up. But Alex Dono was pretty emphatic about what he thought. Colorado would do this season. The Rebels play the two-lane green wave Saturday at 2.30 Central. Trey Harris goes on for more touchdowns, maybe? I don't know. Catch every play of the Rebels hometown broadcast with Sirius XM on Channel 190 or on the SXM app, searching Ole Miss Rebels. There we go. All right, whenever you look at this Ole Miss game, the first play for Mercer, just a straight-up-the-gut run. Quarterback gets there, scores a touchdown. It honestly looked a lot like, remember when Bo Wallace ran that against LSU in like night or in 2012? Almost said 1912. We're not that old. Uh, On 2012, where he gets in Tiger Stadium, he has like a 70 yard touchdown run. That's kind of what it reminded the quarterback from Mercer. But he's a good player. They make plays, they do a nice job of scheming stuff, they do a good job of making players on the defense move and exploiting that space. The problem is they're not good enough to go up against a team like Ole Miss to where if they get behind the chains at all, it's over. It was complete and utter domination on the defensive side of the ball after that first touchdown. For example, that first touchdown run, the first play of the game, 
Mercer gained 75 yards rushing. It was a 75-yard touchdown run. Now, if you look at the total at halftime, Mercer had 73 yards. So that means throughout the entirety of the first half, they gained negative two yards, something like that. Their rushing total was somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 or 16, um, more than that, as they get into like the mop-up time of the game. The defense played pretty well. It was pretty dominant. Now, there's some questions, and probably with what Ole Miss was put on film, they were doing a combination of two things, okay? Some of Ole Miss's best stuff, they're probably holding back because they're saving that for Tulane. And I don't think they're going to try and save it for Alabama, but I do think they tried to save it today. So we had, did not see one of the things or, that Ole Miss does best. I, don't, I do not think Ole Miss put on their film what they did best. The flip side of it is some, some interesting stuff, some interesting formations, some interesting concepts probably did get played in that first game because Tulane and Alabama and Georgia Tech and LSU, they're all going to have to spend time on their scout team preparing for it. Stuff like that happens. You ha- you don't you want to save some of the stuff that you do as that is the best stuff that you do, but you also want to put stuff on tape that is going to cause the other team to have to waste time preparing for that. If that makes sense, and I think Pete Golding did that. Dejon F- Anthony got an interception in the game. They lived in the backfield. Suntarian Perkins actually led the team in tackles. I talked all the time, and I have talked all the time about Suntarian Perkins has never stepped on a football field when he wasn't the best player on it. I don't know that he still hasn't. I thought when he got to college, it would slow down, but nine tackles all over the field. He has a nose instinctually for the football, and Pete Golding can just use that each and every time to build a defense that can be pretty stingy. And Xavion Harris, by the way, absolute monster. Absolute monster. I did not see J.J. Pekis. I do expect him to play eventually. I don't know exactly what went on there. But front seven-wise, the key, whenever I said the keys for the game last week, we did our keys episode, um, it was less than four yards a carry for Mercer. And this was with a 75-yard run on the first play. Mercer averaged 2.5 yards per carry. So that's a win there. Jackson Dart was effective on the middle of the field. As we pointed out, that's a win there. And newcomers having to really perform. And let's talk about that real quick before we go into lines. A couple of newcomers made all of the plays, basically. Trey Harris, four touchdowns. His basic Ole Miss debut was an SEC player of the week type performance. Like six catches, 133 yards, and four touchdowns. He was just a beast. And whenever he has the ball in his hands, the one thing you notice is like pre-injury Laquan movement and and running with the football. I don't know about speed. I don't know about anything like that, but the physicality that he plays with and the athleticism that he has honestly reminded me a little bit of pre-injury Laquan. Picture um, Laquan Treadwell versus Alabama in 2014. That Laquan Treadwell. And, and, and that guy was a special player. But the movement that you see after he gets the ball in his hands and the way he works it's pretty instinctual and physical indeed. And now we talk about Suntarian Perkins. Nine tackles, had a sack. The TFL was the sack, had one pass defense. Just great plays for the young freshman. He's the, he was the best defensive player that has come out of Mississippi since Tony Connor. And you can absolutely see why. Now it's going to get a little bit tougher this week. And we're going to get into that as this week goes on. But whenever you look at what this defense could be, how the performance can go, all of that good stuff, be pretty fired up about that indeed. Uh, it, it, it's, it's pretty cool. I, I'm pretty fired up about what can happen even defensively because I've described my prediction for this defense, and we all know if you watch this show, it's conky. They're good at one or two things and things like that. I think they're at least at that level at that point. That that level was almost the floor at this point after seeing the team play this weekend. So we'll see exactly what this Ole Miss defense can do against Tulane. The kicking situation, a little bit interesting. Alternating kickers, I mean, I guess you can get away with stuff like that. 
Um, they they both performed admirably. Nobody missed a kick. Punt game was okay. He almost brusted one. We almost gave up a punt return for a touchdown. Jalen Knox ran him down. We we did talk about last week about the return guy that Mercer has, and he's he's a legit NFL prospect. So we'll see exactly what goes on there. But if you look at the big things and our keys to the game, our three things match up is, yes, we did everything that I wanted to see and that I thought was keys for the game last week. So I'm pretty fired up about that. Now, when we come back, we are going to go over week two lines. They have come out. We're going to talk about exactly where the Rebels sit versus the Tulane Green Wave. But right now, I do want to let you know that today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Get ready for the NFL season with an incredible offer from FanDuel. FanDuel. It's America's number one sports book. Right now, customers, new customers, can bet $5 and get $200 back in bonus bets, guaranteed. Plus, all customers who bet $5 will get $100 off NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. Now, this is the best time to join FanDuel. I mean, it really is. Just the Sunday ticket thing makes the $5 bet worth it. The app is easy to use, and you can be on everything, bet on everything from Fred's spreads to props and even more. So visit fanduel.com slash locked on and kick off the NFL season with an offer you won't want to miss. FanDuel, it's an official partner of the NFL. Thanks for making the Locked On Ole Miss podcast your first listen every day. We're free and available wherever you get your podcast, including YouTube. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every single day. Hey, just another reminder, go to the go to Sirius XM and on channel 190, that's 190, this weekend you can listen to the Ole Miss Rebels home team broadcast of every play of the Ole Miss Rebels versus the Tulane Green Wave. You can also catch it on the SXM app by searching Ole Miss. So do that, search that, enjoy the ball game and the sounds of David Kellum. Always fun to do that. All right, week two lines. Can you believe we're already week two? We were rushing to get the offseason over with, and, and now we're already, like, into the season, and just you're just dreading it getting away from you. It's, it's, it's a mess. But if you look at the week two lines, now Vandy is a 10.5-point underdog at Wake Forest. This game is on the ACC Network Saturday morning at about 11 o'clock. This is a game Vanderbilt has to have. They are an underdog. Vandy has a talented team, but, well, talented for Vandy um, and under their terms. This is a game they have to get. No Sam Hartman. This Wake Forest team is going to be a little bit different. If out, Vandy can pull this off, they need to go 4-0 in the non-con. I think this is a game they can win. I'm not overly impressed with Lake Forest right now, but we will see exactly what happens there. Ball State's at Georgia. Georgia's a 45 and a half point favorite over the Cardinals. If honestly, if Georgia plays like they did against um, UT Martin and Kincaid Dent, they're not going to cover the 45 and a half. But uh, this is a situation. Ball State, they must be pretty pretty bad. Our no-line games of the week, we're talking about that. Eastern Kentucky is at Kentucky. It's a no-line game. It's a situation to where if they're talking about this game on Tuesday, it's a problem. Texas A&M is favored by four and a half points over Miami. Texas A&M not only covered against New Mexico over the weekend um, when they were 39-point favorites, they're in a position to where they can score a little bit. Now they're going down into South Florida, they're going to deal with all of that stuff. A&M and Miami should be increasingly interesting. Last year, it was a game that was kind of a warning sign type of game. We'll see exactly what it looks like this year. This is a game, honestly, that both teams desperately need to get, whether it be Miami or Texas A&M. So we'll see exactly how that looks. Ole Miss is a four-and-a-half-point favorite on the road at Tulane. This is a game that I expect on the line to go up. Ole Miss will probably end up being favored by about a touchdown by a kickoff. Tulane's a good ball team. I'm not saying they are a bad ball team. Um, I'm saying that they are a step up away from Mercer. They are 
probably not a step up to Georgia Tech. I, I do think Georgia Tech is the most talented non-conference game that Ole Miss is going to have to play. Now, Tulane is going to make some plays. They are. They, Michael Pratt threw four touchdowns. Um, they do not have that running gap back. They do not have that running game. Wide receiver, they have a little jet at wide receiver that caught some touchdown passes as well. South Alabama, I don't know if they're good. I know that Carter Bradley, the um, Gus Bradley's son, who's the quarterback at USA, had a pretty decent day. Um, decent quarterback play appears to be the Achilles heel for Tulane. They're going to have to line up and really stop Quinshawn Judkins. And and also USA's um, starting running back was Kentrell Bullock. Um, so literally – they were playing a game with the team starting our third or fourth string running back last year. Really interesting indeed. Um, I, I, I think Tulane is going to be a decent test. This is a game that if Ole Miss, Ole Miss should be one or two touchdowns, it should be a 31 to 17 type of football game. But if, if everything goes right, if Ole Miss plays clean, I don't think Tulane can win this game. Although Tulane's going to put up a fight and Michael Pratt's a really good quarterback. And they're going to do some things that work. All right, Kent State is at um, Arkansas. Arkansas is favored by 38 and a half points. I do expect Arkansas to cover that pretty easily. Kent State lost everybody in the transfer portal after their coach, Sean Lewis, went to Colorado. By the way, congratulations to Sean Lewis for um, being the offensive coordinator that called that game. That, that was a pretty awesome job for the Colorado Buffaloes to get a win as a 20-point underdog. People assign underdogs, they don't give enough credit to high-transfer teams because they view them as a bad thing. If you are transferring from your school, you are obviously less than the school you were at. Betting has not caught up complete, completely with this age of the transfer portal. Austin P is at Tennessee. It's a no-line game. Tennessee should just drill them. Middle Tennessee is at Missouri. Same thing. Missouri's defense and everything should shut down Middle Tennessee as well. Game of the week. Texas is at Alabama. And we talked about um, this game, and we have talked about it for, honestly, weeks at this point. Um, I do expect Texas to give them a game. Alabama looked really good over the weekend in their 56-7 win. I think it was 56-7 over Middle Tennessee. Grambling's at LSU. That's a no-line game. McNeese is at Florida. That's a no-line game. Arizona is at Mississippi State. That's going to be a bigger test for the Bulldogs that kind of had a slow start out of the gate last week against Southeastern Louisiana. We'll see what happens with the Arizona Wildcats coming to town. Furman is at North Carolina. That's a no-line game. And Auburn is at Cal. They have to go all the way across country. The Hugh Freeze experiment is well underway on the Plains. This is the type game that it might not look exactly right. I think Cal beat the beat the brakes off somebody. Should be very interesting indeed. Those are the week two lines. The SEC, lots of games coming up. Also, you can tune into SEC after dark on Wednesday night. You can turn into tune into Biscuits and SEC weekend preview on Friday. That's on the SEC after dark channel on YouTube. You can catch it there. We have all kinds of stuff. Um, Dids in the Dugout, that's the Derek Vandy Griff show, um, comes on. We, we have a good bit of content that is starting to roll out of that channel. And Jeb Beecham and all that is going to take care of as well. So thank you very much for making the Locked On Ole Miss podcast your first listen. We are free and available wherever you get your podcast, including YouTube. We're part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team, every single day. Week one is in the books, and it went honestly better than anybody could have predicted. 73 to 7, folks. Enjoy it. Tulane Green Wave this weekend. Tomorrow, we will get into previewing that game. We have Dalen Flowers coming up tonight. We have Pratt Rogers tomorrow. We have Bill Flowers Wednesday. We have Gary Smith Thursday. We have Tom Vanderford Friday. And we have Brian Smith one of those days as well, talking recruiting. We have a lot of stuff going on as we've hit game week. Hope everybody has a good time, and we will talk to you tomorrow. Hotty toddy.